Good morning. And what a, a wonderful morning it is for us to be able to, in Clock Congregation, to be able to join together for worship in our church hall after 13 weeks of lockdown. Seaford had their which were the Reverend Archers in the, uh, on the table at the, as at the exit here, to be taken by anyone, uh, some have Adrian's name on. And also, please take the DVDs and the Hope magazine as you leave this morning as well. May I ask Alice to lead us in worship. Well, good morning. Uh, this is actually the first Sunday I've been with you in person, despite all the online services, so it's great uh, to finally be here. And what a morning it is as we come to worship our risen Lord and Saviour. I want to read from 1 Corinthians as we come to worship today. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable will clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And the imperishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory, where, O oh, death, is your sting. And we declare those words this morning as we come to worship our risen Lord and Savior. And let's do that as we sing, Thine be the glory.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou over death hast won. And so, Lord, we needed a Savior, and we give thanks to you that you sent your Son, that he paid the price in full. He paid the price we could not pay. And, Lord, we pray that this Easter Sunday we would come to the cross afresh and know the power and know the love and know the grace, and that we would see the empty tomb and know the hope and the life that it gives. Point us to the cross and point us to the empty tomb today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read the account of the crucifixion and the resurrection from the Gospel of John this morning. It's a rather lengthy reading, but I think it's important for us to get the whole picture of the Easter story. We're going to pick up from John chapter 19, and verse 1. John chapter 19, beginning to read at verse 1, and this is the Word of God. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown, Read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. 
The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled jesus said i am thirsty a jar of the other but when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead they did not break his legs instead one of the soldiers pierced Jesus side with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water the man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true he knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled not one of his bones will be broken And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 35 kilograms. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she went, she bent over, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brother and tell him, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading 
of his word. I've brought something along with me today. It's probably one of my favorite things of Easter. It's an Easter egg. Not only is an Easter egg my favorite thing about Easter, but this is also my favorite chocolate lint. Unbelievable. So I thought the service, first day back in the church, it might be a wee bit long. So I'll bring me Easter egg if I get hungry, in case I don't make it home for lunch. So you don't mind if I just leave this here and nibble at this all day? Oh, I mightn't be nibbling at too much. It's empty. You see, it's empty because actually I had it last night. But Mary, when she went to the tomb that first Easter Sunday, she found something empty as well. It wasn't an Easter egg. It was a tomb. But the Easter egg reminds us of it. For just as the egg is round, so was the stone that was rolled away. So this Easter, when you see your empty Easter egg and go to throw it in the bin, you remember that the tomb too is empty, that Jesus is alive, and that is the greatest news there has ever been, that Jesus died for you, but he rose again. Today, Jesus is alive, and the Easter egg reminds us of that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you that Jesus is alive, that he loves us, that he died for us, and he wants to know us. Would you help us to see him and to know him and to trust him? Lord, we pray that we would know the Easter story afresh this year, that we would know the power and the love and the grace of the cross, but also the hope and the life of the resurrection. Lord, we thank you today that on this Easter Sunday, we can gather together again in person. Lord, we have longed for this day for weeks, and we thank you that we can do this. We pray for wisdom and safety as we gather together, Lord. But Lord, we thank you that as your people, we can gather together to sing praise to your name. And Lord, across this land, as people gather again for worship in person, we pray for wisdom and for safety. But above all, we pray that your name would be lifted high, that your name would be glorified, and that your name would be known, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is risen. Lord, we pray for the congregation of Clock and of Seaford, Lord. This time of vacancy, Lord, we pray for wisdom and for your spirit and your power to be upon them. Watch over them and keep them at this time. And as the process begins for a new minister, Lord, would you watch over that and be within that? But Lord, we thank you that you already know the person who will fill this vacancy. We pray that you would be preparing them, that they would preach your word and faithfully serve your people in this place so that your name would be glorified, so that your name would be made known. Lord, we pray for the Reverend Owen Patterson as he leads the vacancy commission. Would you watch over him? and keep him. Give him wisdom as he, as he has meetings and goes to commissions and committees, Lord, and as he serves his own churches too, Lord. And Lord, in a world that is lost, in a world of fear, in a world of confusion, Lord, at this time, we pray this Easter that you would point us to the hope and to the assurance of the cross and resurrection. Remind us of that afresh today, Lord. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to praise again as we stand. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
we come to study God's word, let's pray. Father, we pray as we open your word that you would speak to us. May our hearts and minds be open to hear, to receive, to understand, and to apply your word. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been along at any of the drive-in services or, or watching online, when I've been taking the services, we've been journeying through, albeit very quickly and briefly. his disciples he declared that he was the way the truth and the life i was back in chapter 14 and since then jesus has comforted his disciples he has prayed he has been betrayed he has been arrested peter has denied him he has appeared before the high priest and Pilate, and all of that in just a matter of days and then we come to the biggest and to the greatest day in history the very first Good Friday back in chapter 19 of John's Gospel. And this morning, this Easter Sunday morning, I want us to look at both the cross and the empty tomb. But I want us to do that by simply looking at three phrases or three words that are uttered across these two chapters. Firstly, in chapter 19, verses 6, we hear the cry, cry, crucify, crucify. And again in verse 15, they cry, crucify him crucify him. You see, these words uttered by the crowd show us the plan of crucifixion and also the pain of crucifixion, which reveal to us the love of God. The plan and pain of the cross, which reveal to us the love of God. You see, the cross was planned. Easter was planned from before the beginning of time. The fall in Genesis 3 did not blindside God so that he had to come up with a plan B to save all of mankind. No, the cross was always God's plan, because God's plan and will is perfect. I'm sure you know how it goes in the early chapters of Genesis. God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates man and woman, Adam and Eve, and all is perfect. Man and woman dwell in relationship with their father, God. But as soon as they disobey, sin enters the world. And so mankind is fallen. Mankind is separated from God. And see, God is holy. It isn't that he just doesn't like sin, but because of his very nature, he cannot tolerate sin. And so mankind is fallen. Mankind is separated from God. And the reality is that there is nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with God. We see right back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we see the very first promise of the plan of the cross. God says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It's the first promise of the plan of the cross. And throughout the Old Testament, everything is looking forward and pointing to the cross. Every single chapter and every single page is looking forward and pointing to the cross. It's all looking forward to Jesus, to his death, because that was God's plan. It isn't the crowd saying, crucify him, that sent Jesus to the cross. It was God's plan and will to save sinners that sent him there. First Peter 1, 19 and 20 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect,
It was the only way that sinful people like you and me could ever be reconciled, saved, and forgiven. The only way was that a perfect, spotless, and righteous sacrifice had to be made. It had to be Jesus. It had to be the cross, because without it, there is no way for you and me ever to be made right with God. You see, the love of God is revealed in the plan of the cross, because God knows what his son is going to go through. He knows what he must suffer. He knows what he is about to face. But it's because of love and grace that God fulfills his plan. His love to save his children, to bring them on to himself, to make a way and to give us life. God didn't have to, but he did it out of love and out of grace. See, the God of the universe, the God who created the world, he was about to be executed, nailed to a cross to save the people that he had created. See, we see the plan of the cross, but there was also the pain of the cross. Verse 1 of chapter 19, Jesus is flogged. He's whipped. His back would have become like a plowed field of blood. They put a crown of thorns on his head, thorns like nails driven in to his head. He's spat at, he's beaten, he's mocked, and then he carries his own cross. You see, the upright of the cross would have been fixed on the hill, and so he would have carried the crossbar. Could be anything up to 50 kilograms. The other Gospels tells us that eventually Simon from Cyrene ended up carrying the cross. Very likely that Jesus may have collapsed from the weight and the pain. And then once he gets to Golgotha, they nail him to the cross through his wrists and through his feet. It's the cruelest and it's the vilest form of murder. We cannot imagine the pain that Jesus felt, but he goes through it for you and for me. He goes through it in love. Last Saturday was a very special day for me. I got engaged to Victoria. I went and picked her up that morning from her house, and I took her to the beach, and I got down on one knee and asked her to marry me. Why? Well, love, because I love her. The way that I showed my love to her was to buy a ring to get down on one knee and ask her to marry me. But Jesus doesn't show his love to us by getting down on one knee with a ring. Jesus showed his love to us by going to the cross, by suffering the pain of the cross and the anguish alone. Greater love has no one than this, and to lay down his life for his friend. This is love, not that we love God, that, but he loved us and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Some people wear the symbol of the cross as an item of jewelry and perhaps you hear people saying that it's lovely. Folks, there was nothing lovely about the cross, but it is the sign of love. There was nothing lovely about the cross, but it is the sign of love. See, the sign of love is not a big red heart, but it's a wooden cross. For it was on that cross that Jesus suffered and bled and died for you and for me. What love, what grace, that the Son of God would take our place, that he would pay our debt, and he would suffer and die for us. John MacArthur says the cross is proof of both the immense love of God and the profound wickedness of our sin. See, the cry, cry, crucify him. But in crying that, we see the plan and we see the pain of the cross which displays and reveals to us the love of God. The cross was the only way that sin could be paid for. It was also how God displayed his immense love for us. St. Clair Ferguson says, when we think of Christ dying on the cross, we are showing the lengths to which God's love goes in order to win us back to himself. They cry, crucify him, because it was the only way that he could save us. But secondly, I want us to see three words that Jesus declares from the cross in verse 30. When he had received his drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus declares it is finished and in doing so declares the definite victory over sin. You see, it is finished means exactly what it says on the tin. It is finished, not just his life, but also his mission. It was done. The work was complete. The purpose for which Jesus had come to earth had been accomplished. You see, it is finished as a victory cry. It's a victory cry over sin. The plan had been fulfilled. 
All the prophecies were fulfilled and completed. Everything of the Old Testament and all of Jesus' life and ministry had been leading to this moment, and now it was done. Every prophecy and every scripture was fulfilled. Verse 24, this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 28, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Verse 36, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Every prophecy, every scripture, every promise fulfilled. His mission, his purpose, complete. In Matthew's gospel, we read that from the cross, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's directly quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1, when David cries out the same to God. You see, Psalm 22 is a psalm of grief and of suffering and of pain. You can understand why Jesus would cry it out from the cross. But right at the very end of that psalm, in verse 31, David says, They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it. He has done it. In other words, it is finished. It's a victory cry. Jesus has made a way. He told his disciples. when man walked on the moon but the greatest day in history was when God died on a cross he declares that sin has been atoned for that mankind has been given away to be made right with God he declares that the sinner can dwell with their father once again but you see his enemies those who hated him well they thought they had won they thought that was it that he was gone he was silenced he was dead but in fact, it was the death that they sent, sentenced him to that would bring the victory, that would accomplish all he came to do. Johnny Erickson Tata says, you can't imagine a more victimized person than Jesus. Yet when he died, he didn't say, I am finished, but it is finished. He didn't pay the victim, and thus he emerged the victor. Folks, we need to be careful never to add or never to take away anything from the completed and victorious work of Christ. When he says it is finished, he means I am enough for you. My death is enough for you. Nothing more, nothing less. See, we don't need to add religion. We don't need to add the church, good living. All we need is Christ because he has done it. It is finished. I can't save you. The church can't save you. Presbyterianism can't save you. Only Christ alone can save you. There was a song released this Easter by City Light called It Was Finished Upon That Cross, and it simply declares that Christ completed and finished his work upon the cross. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. Now the curse that has been broken, Jesus paid the price for me. Full the pardon he has offered, great the welcome that I receive. Boldly I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more guilt to carry, it was finished upon that cross. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus cries that it's finished as he declares his victory over sin. And they cry, crucify him as we see the love of God in the plan and pain of the cross. Jesus cries that it's finished as he declares his victory over sin. And finally, in chapter 20, verse 16, Jesus simply speaks one word, Mary, as we see the hope of resurrection. I often wonder what that first Easter Saturday would have been like the pain, the mourning, all hope is gone, is lost. Jesus is dead. He promised, he said he was the one, but they've killed him. It's over. It's back to fishing 
back to tax collecting, back to normal. On Saturday, a beaten, abused, broken man lay dead, sealed away in a borrowed tomb. On Saturday, life died, hope died, love died, the future died. But that was only Saturday. And Sunday's coming. Verse 1 of chapter 20, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and she arrives, but the stone is removed. And so she runs to Peter and to John. And what does she tell them? They've taken him. They've stolen his body. I don't know where they've put him. She never does it cross her mind that he could have been risen, that he could be alive. The only logical explanation to her is that someone has taken his body. After all, people don't come back to life after they're dead, so he must have been taken. Peter and John run to the tomb, and of course, Peter being Peter is the one who runs straight on in. The tomb's empty. Well, it's empty apart from the strips of linen and the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus. Mary's outside the tomb. She's weeping, hopeless, lost, and two angels appear, and they ask, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken him, and she turns around, and before her is a man course she would never think that it was Jesus he's dead so it must be the gardener and he asks her why are you crying who is it that you're looking for she thinks maybe this man has taken him maybe he knows but then the wonder and the amazement when Jesus simply says to her Mary Mary and in that one word we see the hope of the resurrection he says, Mary, and she turns towards him and cries out, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher. The scales have fallen off her eyes, and she can see it is her Lord, her Messiah, her Savior. It is Jesus. You can just imagine the warmth and the tenderness, the love and the compassion in his voice as he says, Mary. The risen Lord is calling her by name. He is alive. This man was dead. She watched him die, and now he's standing before her, calling her name. Because you see, that was the morning that sealed the promise. That was the morning that his buried body began to breathe. That was the morning that the roaring lion of Judah declared that the grave has no hold on us. Saturday was hopeless. But we have hope on Sunday. Because Sunday was the day that he rose, the day that he gave us the living hope. And so as his followers, we can live today in the hope of the resurrection. We rejoice in the resurrection. Every other religion, well, their leader is dead and buried. But where is Jesus? He's alive and at the right hand of the Father. He has risen victorious over death. And today we have not just a dying Savior, but also a risen Lord. Let me read to you a few verses from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. The fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you, know your, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see.
You see, one day this world will be no more, and if you're in Christ, well, then you have the hope and you have the assurance of the resurrection. Jesus simply says, Miriam, we see the hope of the resurrection, and so we can cry today, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Death is defeated, and just as he called Mary, maybe he is calling you today. John Calvin says, in Mary, we have an image of our calling, for the only entrance to the true knowledge of Christ is when he first knows us and then intimately invites us to himself. Maybe this Easter, Easter 2021, he is inviting you. See, that first Easter Sunday, he said, Mary, but maybe today he is calling your name. I see, the reality is that without him, we will be raised not to everlasting life, but to everlasting death, to everlasting separation from God. The only way to avoid that is his death and his resurrection. The crowd cry, crucify him. And we see the love of God displayed in the plan and the pain of the cross. Jesus Christ, it is finished. And we see his victory over sin. And he calls Mary and we see the hope of resurrection. Glenn Scrivener tells an illustration of a man that is stuck in a pit. The pit is so deep that there is nothing that the man can do to get himself out of it. He's stuck at the bottom, and unless he can get help, he will die. Buddha comes along, and he stops, and he looks down, and he sees the man in trouble and in misery. So he takes out a piece of paper and a pen, and he writes a message. He folds it up, and he throws it down the pit to the man. The man opens it up, and he reads it, and it says, to get yourself out of the pit, to save yourself, you have to meditate your way out. So the man meditates and meditates, but when he's finished meditating, he's still stuck at the bottom of the pit. A short time later, the great philosopher Confucius comes along. He too looks down and sees the man in trouble, so he writes a note and he throws it down. The man opens it and it says, to save yourself, to get out of the pit, you need to think your way out. So the man thinks and he thinks and he thinks, but he's still stuck at the bottom of the pit. People pass and people give him advice, but he's still stuck in the pit. The man's surely going to die. And then Jesus comes along. And he stops and he looks down and he sees the man. But he writes no note. No, instead, Jesus jumps into the pit with the man. He puts the man on his shoulders and he carries him out. Not only does he carry him out to safety, he goes one step further and he clothes him. You see, Jesus stepped into this world, into the pit and climbed onto the cross so that we could be lifted up out of our pit of sin and death. But not only did he save us out of the pit, but he also clothes us with his righteousness. That's love, that's grace. See, Christ took what we deserve so that we could get what he deserves. It isn't the first swap, but it's the gospel. It's grace. See, we are sinners unworthy of the cross, but it is only because of the cross that we can become worthy. We are sinful, fallen people, separated from our maker and from our father. There is nothing that we could do to save ourselves. So in love, Jesus took our place so that we could take his, so that we could take his righteousness, so that we could stand before the father. And the only way that that could be done was on the cross, where the son of God suffered and died but he cried, it is finished. He had done it. He had defeated sin. He had made a way. His death means life. But we rejoice today and we live in hope because this Jesus who died also rose. He rose victorious over sin and death. And he gives us hope and calls us by name to come and to follow him and to know that resurrection also. We are unworthy of the cross but only because of the cross can we be made worthy.
you and for me. And he declared it is finished. He had defeated sin. He had defeated death. And today, he is alive. And he wants to know you. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou over death hast won. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that on that cross, Jesus Christ bore all of our sin, that he paid the price, that he took upon himself the wrath of God. And he took that for us so that we could gain and inherit his righteousness so that we could stand before you in glory, that we receive God's, your riches at Christ's expense. But Lord, we rejoice and we celebrate today that Christ is alive. Let that be our victory cry, our anthem, that Jesus Christ died, but he rose again, that the tomb is empty. Lord, let us rest and abide in the cross and in the empty tomb today and for the rest of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close this morning as we sing, O to see the dawn.